It was called the Invisible War. He said, it is a the battle for your mind, and that battle is vicious. It is intense. It is unrelenting. It's unfair. Because Satan never plays fair. And the reason why it is so intense is that your greatest access is your mind. One of the most important things that we need to learn and teach others is how to guard, strengthen, and renew our minds. Because the battle of sin always starts in the mind first. It's where it starts. So if we can stop the battle in the beginning, would we not win more? You see... I fear that we have learned to live in not victory. We should be winning the battle. We should be winning the war. We should be victorious. But I feel that most of us do not wake up victorious. We do not look at, well, I was victorious today in my life. I was a winner today in my life. And we believe lies. We, we tend to think on the negative of things most of the time. I mean, it's just like this. I, I was wondering the other day, I was like, man, I just don't feel like at work that I'm doing as well as I anymore. But yet I, I had a million, I've already had a million dollar year. And apparently I must be doing well because my boss gave me a large raise. And then we had a meeting this last third Wednesday, and they're talking, well, you know, integrity, and the maintenance side, they've already met their goals for the year of what we said. But, guys, that don't mean we just sit back and don't do anything this last quarter. Yeah. Um, you know, they were talking about mine and Clinton. And they were like, you know, they just seem to be winning a lot. And I wasn't feeling that way. I wasn't feeling like a winner. I was feeling like, man, I, I, I think right now we're dead in the water. But yet they see me as, a, as winning, but I see myself as dead in the water. What's, what's wrong with that thought? Where, where, where is it? One is myself speaking death. The Bible says that. Life and death are in the tongue. And that doesn't mean just what we speak out here, but what we speak inside here, I think. I, I want you to look, and in a minute we'll be, we'll be there to Corinthians, but I want you to listen to this. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, is that truth? Was he speaking truth? Yeah. yeah. He was speaking truth. Uh, he, he was not lying at all. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, was that truth? No. God didn't say they couldn't touch it. God didn't say that they could take it. and uh, all they, they, they could have probably taken it and, and rubbed it on their bodies. God just said you can't eat of it. That's what we know of, what God told Adam. You know, he could not eat of that tree. But she said that God said, You shall neither touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now, what did the serpent just do? Doubt. He, he planted a seed of doubt. Now, I don't know if how long this went on. It, it says, 
For God, and then he goes on to say, For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He put in the seed of doubt, then he put in a lie. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the tree thereof, and did eat, and gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Now, I don't think she took of the tree, possibly, Brother Lee, right after she got done talking to the serpent. It don't really tell us. We know that God created the earth and man, and on the seventh day he rested. We know God did all that in six days and then he rested. We don't know when this actually happened that the serpent came to the woman. I don't know when it was that she was out picking fruit and doing her chores and doing her things. And, and understand, she was just going along about life, doing her thing, what she was supposed to do. And then all of a sudden, this this, this serpent comes and beguiles her. Now, I don't know if she went right then. You know what? That's right. I think I'll pick that fruit right now. But she might have went home for a few days and sat down and said, hmm. She might have even sat there and thought, you know, that, that fruit did look good. She sat there eating the apple. She said, you know, I've had the same old apple. Maybe she was eating a fig. Maybe she was eating, you know, a date. And she's like, well, these are good, but man, that, that fruit over there looks pretty good. And she started thinking about it. See, usually when sin comes in is when we begin to be ungrateful for what we have. Because she had anything and everything she wanted. She was in a perfect environment. You know what? Went too hot, went too cold. I mean, it had to be perfect because they're naked. They didn't need clothes. So the, the, the atmosphere had to be really good. And they're just enjoying life. But there was that seed. And that seed began to grow. That seed of doubt, as it grew, one day she said to herself, hmm, maybe I will pick that. Now, she's already told herself that she's not even touched it. Maybe she went over there, Brother Lee, because she's thinking in her mind, we're going to die if I touch it. And she went over there and she touched it. She waited a couple of days. Man, I didn't die. Hmm. Maybe she went over there a couple days after that and she picked one of them. She didn't eat it, but she picked it. And she didn't die. And then one day she went over there and picked it. And she picked two of them. One for her, one for Adam. She brought it home. Adam said, hmm, um, eat? Uh, we're, we're not supposed to eat of that. But look at it. It looks good. Now, she couldn't say everybody else is doing it. Like we, we, we normally say. She said, it looks good. God said we're not to eat of it. She goes, I've not to eat it. So he grabs it and he takes a bite. Now I don't know if that's how it happened, Brother Lee. But isn't that how sin works? Isn't that usually the way it, it goes about? And I think man decided, you know, I don't want to be in here without her. 
And if that's going to kill her, then I want to die too. So he grabbed it and he took a bite of it too. And then all of a sudden they realized he looked at her and she looked at him. She goes, gross. And he looked at her and said, wow. <laughs> and she said, I'll cover it up. <laughs> and she said, you need to cover that up too. <laughs> and, and they sewed fig leaves together. Made themselves clothing. Then God came in the evening time. Adam, where art thou? God knew where he was. He just wanted Adam to figure out where he was at. God already knew what they had done. Now here's the question, Brother Lee. Like I said, I, we don't really have the full story of everything that went on. We just know there was a day that the serpent came and talked to her. We don't know if it was on the same day on that same day, did she pick of the fruit? On that same day, did she eat of it? Or did maybe weeks or days, maybe months went by before she finally did? I really don't think it took that long. I think it was pretty quick. But the thing is, we really don't know the full story of how it all played out other than that they did take the fruit. They were tempted. Um, and, and when that happened, then sin became very evident in their life. I think that first half of six was Satan did all that too. Doesn't say so. Yeah, and and when 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 it, the woman saw that it was good for food and that it was pleasant. Yeah, I think he kind of suggested that you ought to look at it. Yeah. Desire of you. Yeah. And, and you know, like I said, I, I think she thought about it because, you know, she, she looked at it. Yeah. She saw it was pleasant. I think that was, was to make one wise. I think those ideas came from him. Yeah, I think they did. I think those he, he planted those seeds. Those seeds were there. And, and as those seeds began to fester, she acted upon that. Mm -hmm. Now, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we began to see how some other things began to happen and flow out. In verse number 3, Second Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 says this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, if she would have brought, cast down those imaginations. Oh, this is going to make me wise like God. This is going to make me like this. And she would cast that down. And if she would have looked at every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And God's told her, you're not to eat of it. And, and if she would have thought of that. And then if she would have did that and brought into captivity her thoughts, then she would not have looked at it and thought, well, that looks like it's good for the flesh. Oh, it looks good for my eyes. Looks like something to make one wise. Then she wouldn't have sinned, would she? And see, that's where we're at. The, the devil plants those little seeds and says, you know, you're, you're really not worth much. You're, you're, yeah, yeah, really, what are you doing? What are you really accomplishing? You ever, you ever felt that way? I, I, I've been really down lately. And I know y'all know that. 
And, and I'm, I've been trying to climb out of it. I've been trying to get out of it. But, you know, it, it's been tough. It's been tough. And, and, and so I'm still fighting that. And it's like the devil throws those seeds of doubt in you. Yeah. You reason within yourself. Yeah. You, well, that's where, that's where, uh, you know, Romans chapter 12 comes into play. Um, we're, we're to reason within ourselves. And that's why it so much is the thing of Paul is saying here that our job is to battle and this battle is to destroy strongholds in our life. There's things that have us. Every one of us has got those areas of our life that what we would call strongholds. And they're holding on to us. And they're really keeping us from being able to advance ourselves in our Christian walk. They're, they're strongholds that, that grab a hold of you and, and hold you and keep you. And what Paul is saying is you are going to have to come to a place that you figure out what those strongholds are. And those strongholds, sometimes it's just, it can be a mental block that you have. Well, I just can't do this, or I can't do that. Um, one stronghold I have is, is a fear of snakes. And there's things that I, I can't do because of the stronghold of fear of snakes. I've never been bit by a snake. But man, they scare me to death. And, and, and sometimes the things will go on and I just can't do it because of snakes. I'm afraid there's going to be a snake in there. I can't do it. Uh, when the guy who works with his is spiders. And and I mean, I, he, he was in a place that one time and he come running out of there. What is it? I thought he just saw a snake. There's a spider in there. He said, can you go in there and get that can of paint? I can't go in there. He just has a very strong phobia of spiders. Uh, spiders aren't as big thing to me as snakes. And, and boy, the, the fear of a snake and Stuff like that, boy, it prevents me from doing a lot of things I won't do. Uh, it really does. And, and Paul is talking about pretensions and arguments that set us against the knowledge of God. What are some of the things that sets us against the knowledge of God? Uh, there's a battle, and it's a mental battle, and there's these strongholds, and these strongholds can can be one of two things. One, it can be a worldview, such as materialism, heathenism, Darwinism, secularism, relativism, communism, atheism, and democratism. Uh, that are strongholds that people have, and they can't get past it. Uh, a stronghold can also be a personal attitude. Worry can be a stronghold. Seeking the approval of others, people, can be a stronghold. Anything that you make an idol in your life can be a stronghold. Fear, guilt, resentment, insecurity. I guess that's been one of mine lately. It's been insecurity. I've had a lot of insecurities lately. And, and there's no reason for it. But they're there. All of these things can be strongholds in our minds. And, and the Bible says that we are to tear them down. We're to tear them down. The Bible says that we're to bring every thought into captivity. Is that what it says here? Mm -hmm. And bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And that last phrase there is to take every thought captive. The Greek word means to 
control, to conquer, to bring into submissiveness. When those thoughts come of insecurities, and those thoughts come of inability, we're to then grab those things and say, I am more than conquerors through Christ. I'm not going to let this win. I'm not going to let this overcome me. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll use it in a way of business. Um, I get scared sometimes when I'm looking at some of these big jobs. You know, I did that one job that was two nine-story buildings and putting it together and how much paint and how much equipment, how much paint hours. And you know what? Put it together, end up being, you know, 400 and something thousand dollars job. We won the job, painted it, and end up with a profit margin of 47% after the job was done. And you know, it still scares me when somebody said, oh, we won't paint the whole outside of this building. Oh, I just did too. And there were nine stories. You know, now they want me to do the CNN Center soon. Hopefully, I bet it already. But those things would be scary. But the thing is, you know what the scariest ones are? Uh, one house. And somebody wants me to come bid, I got this house, I want you to paint my house. I can't, I can't get those for some reason. I, I just, they scare me to death. But I look at a nice story building, figure it out. You think I can figure a house out? That's a mental block. I can do it. It's just that there's a mental block there that keeps me from doing that. Um, this, this, in, in church, I, I think, you know, could we really, could I really build a church? But I'm divorced. Look what Paul did. He wasn't married. If God could use Paul, could he not use a guy who divorced uh, to, to do something? But you know what? We doubt ourselves and we allow those insecurities to come. And we, we, we don't take captive those thoughts. And what we got to do is we got to grab that thought and say, I understand what I'm thinking and I bring it into captivity. And we must make that thought submit to us, to the will of God. Let me ask you a question. Does God, one of the things we, we, we read that the calling of God are without repentance. What's that mean? That when God calls you, he's called you. There's no going back. So if God's called me to preach, let me call to preach, right? No going back on that. I remember people used to, one time, they say, Oh, you're still preaching? It's like, I guess they thought it was a fad. And one day I just quit. No, oh, I'm still preaching. Been doing it since I was 16. Got called to preach when I was 16. And I'm only 59. So I've done it how many years? What's 59 minus 16, 42, 43, 43. I guess one day that fad's going to wear off. Maybe one day that fad of 43 years is going to wear off. And I'm just saying, okay, yeah, I'm, I, yeah. I'm done doing that. I don't think I ever will be, Brother Lee. I don't think you ever will be. Uh, and, and you've been doing it a long time, too. And I may not pastor, 
But there, I'm still going to serve God somewhere, do something for God somewhere. And, and so it's bringing that thought into captivity. In other words, every thought to obedience to Christ, make that thought obedient to the Word of God. It's to bring it into submission, to bring it under control. Now, here's the thing. I can tell you that, but I'm not doing you any favors and I don't tell you how to do it. So how do I do that? How do you teach other people to do that? Well, here, here's where I believe it starts. How do I make my mind mind? You ever try to make your mind mind? You, you ever heard somebody say, well, I made my mind up. Yeah. I, I believe that. I, I've seen some things you made up before. But I, I've noticed that my mind doesn't always mind. Does your mind always mind? No. I, I, I've, I've often noticed that my mind can be disobedient. Sometimes it can be very rebellious. It wants to go in a different direction most of the time than the way it should go. When I want it to think a certain way, it wants to go another way sometimes. When I need it to ponder, it wants to wonder. <laughs> and when I need it to pray, my, my thoughts seem to float away a lot of times. Paul sort of had that same problem over in Romans, didn't he? He said, that which I want to do, I do not. That which I do, I do, I don't want to do. Basically, he was just saying, I, I have a problem in my mind. And the battle for sin always starts in the mind. Uh, well, let's turn, turn, look, at, look at Romans. Book of Romans, chapter 7. And verse number 19. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would, not that I do. If you go up to verse 18, he says, For I know that in me, that is my flesh, dwell no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. And verse 20 says, Now if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in the law... That when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is my member. Luke 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the bond body of this death? That is a mind battle he's fighting. And, and if we lose that battle with our mind, then most of the time we end up sinning. But if we win the battle of our mind, then we can win the battle over sin. And the fact is, the reason we have so many ineffective Christians today is that they do not know how to fight the battle of the mind. And we've got to spend more time teaching how to fight the battle of the mind. I think there's four principles in fighting the battle of the mind. I'm going to give you the first one today. We're going to look at the rest next week. But I've studied a lot about the mind over the years. Because I feel like it is something that we need to do. And the Bible talks a lot about our mind. It talks about renewing our minds, submitting our minds, and bringing our thoughts into captivity. And there are at least hundreds, I'm sure, of principles in the Bible that deals with our thought life and our mind. Your mind is your greatest access. It's the greatest thing you've got, is your mind. And I hear people all the time saying, I'm losing my mind. Some people need to. <laughs> but here, here, here's the first 
thing I want to give you. And listen to this. Don't believe everything you think. Don't believe everything you think. The, the, the world puts suggestions into our minds on a daily basis. Every hour of the day. And our, our mind... These suggestions many times are false, and they're bombarded with these false ideas all the time, whether it's TV, commercials, driving down the road and seeing billboard signs, listening to things on the radio. Our mind is continually being bombarded by these thoughts and these things that we're not even aware of many a time. And Satan makes suggestions all the time. But our problem really goes much deeper than just Satan. Everybody has a mental illness. <laughs> Every one of us is mentally ill to a certain extent. The mental illness that we have is called sin. Sin has caused all men to be mentally ill. And women. But most of the men, no. Uh, we, we are. And the Bible uses a, at least a dozen different phrases for the conditions of our mind under sin. Here's, here's some of the things it says. In, in, in Deuteronomy, I won't read it, it says that our minds are confused. In Job, he talks about our minds being anxious and closed. In Ecclesiastes, he talks about our minds being evil and restless. In Leviticus, in Isaiah, he talks about our minds being rash and deluded. The Bible talks about a troubled mind in 2 Kings. A depraved mind in 1 Timothy. A simple mind in Romans. A dull mind in 2 Corinthians. A blinded mind in 2 Corinthians. And a corrupted mind in Timothy 3. Our minds are broken. Broken by sin, which means we can't trust even what we think ourselves sometimes. Jeremiah 17 9 says, Our hearts are deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the heart there is not talking about this, it's more talking about the mind. And we have an amazing ability. I do, you do, to lie to ourselves. You ever lied to yourself? Yeah. When you're 80 and you climb a ladder up on your house to try to fix things, that's lying to yourself. I can do it. And you might can, but it ain't the smartest thing in the world to do. <laughs> I'm not preaching to anybody. I'm not making this personal to anybody else, my brother Lee. But we all do that. And many a times we, uh, I remember I had a surgery. It was due to me listening to my mind. My mind said I could outrun that teenage boy on that trail. And I couldn't. And a root jumped up out of the ground, slapped me upside the foot, tripped me. I fell on my shoulder and ended up having to have shoulder surgery. Now, I would listened to the wrong person that day. And because of that, it cost me. We tell ourselves that things aren't as bad as they really are. Sometimes they are. We tell ourselves that things are better than they are. We tell ourselves that we're doing okay when we're not doing okay. And we tell ourselves it's no big deal when it is a big deal. And we lie to ourselves in so many ways. And in fact, the Bible tells us that we cannot be trusted to tell ourselves the truth. And that's why we need to question our own thoughts and teachings ourselves how not to believe everything that we think. And just because you can get a thought doesn't mean that thought is correct. Now, 
I'm not saying that you're insufficient, but I'm saying you're insufficient. Mm -hmm. We are insufficient apart from the Word of God. That's why the Bible says we renew our minds. How do we do that? With the Word of God. We renew it. Why do we need to renew it? Because it's being bombarded by all of the thoughts of the world that is destroying us. And this is the reason why we have so many fallen Christian leaders because all sin begins with a lie. And the Bible says Satan is the father of liars. And anytime you sin, I'm going to read this to you, anytime you sin, you're thinking that you know better than God. God said this, but what about this? And so you have a question, what do you think? First John 1 John 1.8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. And so the Bible is very clear that we can deceive ourselves. That we can lie to ourselves. We say we have no sin. Well, what have I just done? I've lied to myself. And we all have blind spots. You've got them, I've got them, we got bald spots. What I mean by that, we have spots that have been calloused over by sin, and therefore we no longer are sensitive to those to that area. And we have desensitized ourselves. And as Luke did, I mean not Luke. Was Luke not Luke? Lot. As Lot did, and he put himself in a sinful area in the Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible says that he vexed himself daily. And what we have done, we have vexed ourselves continually because we fail to be in the Word of God and in be in prayer as much as we should. And we're not renewing our minds with the word of God, we're renewing our minds with the fifth of the world. And we do it on a continual basis. Mm -hmm. And if we're not careful, then we'll come to that place that we become insensitive to the word of God. And we can't always tell ourselves the truth because we don't stop to really think what the truth is. And frequently, we make snap judgments. We fail to notice important details. We have more background biases than we realize. Well, this has always worked out this way. This, I, I, I just don't, I, I don't think, you know, that's, that's going to be a problem, you know. And we jump to conclusions, and the Bible talks about jumping to conclusions in Romans chapter 2. And one of the biggest reasons why we need to not believe everything we think is that we see what we want to see. Now, now listen to this. this. This is amazing. I read this. I, this talks about our brain. One of the things that I learned is that the optic nerve which is the only nerve that goes directly to the brain, actually sends more impulses from your brain forward than from your eye backwards. In other words, I think I see this. I see this, but I'm really seeing it as I want to see it sometimes. Do you realize that? You know why she still thinks you're the most handsome person she's ever seen? Because of that backward eye nerve that keeps throwing that forward. If she could really see you, she might not think that way, Brother Lee. <laughs> <laughs> if she saw you the way we saw I'm just but but that's where our, our nerve, that's where our octave nerve is. It sees what it wants to see. You ever heard somebody, well, you're just seeing what you want to see. Well, there's a truth to that. Actually. Our, our, our brain is telling us to see that. And you know, in the brain, you see what your face looks like, and I don't. 
Exactly. It's because of the way our brains are. And it's because of the way the optic nerves are. And what we've seen and what we've taught ourselves, which means your brain is telling you what you see. And so therefore, you are already preconditioned. And we need to remind ourselves and teach ourselves not to believe everything that we think. Now, next week we're going to look at, look at guard your mind from garbage. And computers, they used to say garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Mm -hmm. That's the same thing that's true with our minds. Mm -hmm. Garbage in, garbage out. People have asked me before, why don't you ever cuss? It's not in me. It's not in me. I don't have that garbage in me to do that. When I get hurt, the first thing that comes to my mind is not to cuss. If I get mad at somebody, my first thought is not to cuss them out. It's not there. You know, when I get mad and upset with things around me, my first thought is not just head to the bar and get drunk. It's not there. But yet that's the first thought of many people because that's what they've been conditioned to do. See, I've been conditioned when I worry to eat. So you must worry a lot more than you think. And I have come to a place that I realize I'm losing the battle in a lot of areas of life that I shouldn't be losing the battle in. Now, I might not be in a place where I'm sinning, but I'm not winning victoriously or living victoriously. And why is that? It's not that I, I'm out here going to bars. I'm out here you know, with a bunch of women. I can't remember the last time I had a date, hardly. And what am I doing? Well, sometimes I'm just sitting at home doing nothing. And that's not winning. I haven't been around my brother and my nephew and niece a lot lately. You know why? Because I always, when I went over there, it was always because Daddy called me and said, hey, I'm going there to see the kids. You're going to come? It was always something me and Daddy did together. And Daddy's not here anymore. And it don't feel right going over there without Daddy. So I've got to change that. It's not fair to the kids. It's not fair to me. And, and so what I do is I go to work. I go home. I come to church. That's it. I don't even go to Walmart anymore. I used to do that. And I sat there at my house yesterday and I thought, man, I just go to the store, just walk around the stores and stuff. I used to do that, go to big lots or somewhere like that and just walk around just to look. Just for no reason. I don't even do that. Like, him, it's time to live again. I stopped living when Daddy died for some reason. I don't know why. But I said, I got to change that. And it's a battle of my mind. A battle of your mind. And I said, okay, Kim, remind yourself. Go through this. Do it. And I know what to do. But sometimes we still just don't do it, do we? And it's the battle of the mind. And once we can win that battle, we'll do much better. You know, I thought, well, I, I just don't think my brother, I think my brother's upset with me about something. And he's not. Well, we just tell our stuff, so... If he was upset with me, he wouldn't have gave me the raise he gave me. Because it was pretty substantial. But do we do that to ourselves? You know, I got garage doors that need to go up. And I keep saying, you need to do it, you need to do it. But then I sit down and I never get up and do it. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it later. We're, we're not winning the war against our minds. 
And it's time that we come back and we win the war and we say, I'm going to take control. I'm going to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And I'm going to win. I, I told the Austins, I said, y'all not going to know what to do when she's not here to help you. I said, maybe you ought to go get some bands right on there. WWMD. What would Mama do? And we're sitting there, and I said that one. Brittany, she goes, Well, that's why I come in here and start folding these clothes, because I know that's what Mama would want these clothes folded. I said, well, maybe that's why everybody here ought to do. I said, what would she do on Sunday morning? She'd get to go to church. Yeah. Because one of them said, you know, I regret that I didn't. I said, well, start now. You see, here's the fact. It's all in our minds. Are we going to win? I've got no, really, there's no reason for me to ever lose. I'm a winner. I, I have these. I have these ladies sometimes tell me, "I don't know why. Why are you not married? Because you, you got a good job. You got good morals. You're good looking. Why are you not married?" Nobody's asked me. <laughs> I'm like, I just haven't found the person yet. But you don't find them sitting at the house either. <laughs> so I've not really looked <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and uh, if I date the wrong people, then I know I'll never marry them. But then you might, then you're in trouble. So what you do is you just don't date them at all. Because if I date the right person, might fall in love and decide to get married. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I want that or not. <laughs> I do and I don't. It's one of those things you got to make up your mind. Like, you know, I, I've got a lot of peace right now and do sort of what I want to do. Hmm. Because I heard when you get married and you're driving around, you get a little person in your car that says, you going to turn down? Are you going to stop? At the stop sign? Are you going to do this? And you know what? I don't miss that. <laughs> I had a little person like that in my car once before. I think the cutest story I ever heard is one day I was driving around, me and Paula, with her, her papa or granddaddy. And Granny Lucy. And Granny Lucy always wore these gloves when they went out driving. Just little white gloves. She always wore them. Just keep her hands warm and stuff. And as we were riding around, Granddaddy said, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do one of these days. I said, what's that? He said, well, if she ever passes, I won't know where to go. Because she's always got that little white glove saying, go there, go there. He said, I guess I just had to hang that little white glove up on my on my window so it could tell me where to go. <laughs> you know, when when she passed, he framed those white gloves and put them up on the wall. Isn't that the sweetest thing you ever heard? I remember when I walked in there after she had passed, I saw those white gloves framed up on the walls. I thought, that's beautiful. I don't know what they did with them. I hope they never threw them away. I would love to have them and hang those white gloves. I'd hang them up on my wall. Those little white gloves meant a lot to him. Her pointing. I said, well, maybe I need that. <laughs> he did. Maybe if I had that, I wouldn't have to think.
like as much, by the way. I don't know. But you know, God knows. If we just submit ourselves to Him and say, God, direct my thoughts, direct my life, help me to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It's not something I got to commit to five years from now. I just got to commit to it for this thought. If I did it on this thought and I decide, I'm, that worked out good. I think I'll do it on the next thought. That worked out good. I think I'll do it on the next thought. We might just get used to it. Wouldn't that be something if we got used? If, if somebody said, what are you thinking? Well, I was thinking about popping you in the face. But I submitted that to the knowledge of God. And he said for me not to. Why would you think about popping me in the face? Because you smarted off to me about something. What else more? This and that and this. But I submitted it to God's authority and forgave you. Well, I'm sorry, brother. I didn't mean to do that. It might just change our whole life, wouldn't it? You might be sitting down on the couch. Miss Lee looks a little sad. You look over and say, You okay? Yeah. What's wrong? I just submitted a thought to God. Really? What was it? Well, I was thinking about slapping you, and he told me not to. I ain't real happy about it because I thought it would make me feel better. <laughs> so, <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if we just lived our lives just open like that, and we submitted every thought, and, and we didn't even hide it from other people. Yeah, I was thinking about coming over here and just, Doing this to your house. But I decided not to, God. When I submitted it to God, God told me not to. It might open up some conversations that go beyond anything. And I think not everybody needs to know exactly what you're thinking all the time. Mm -hmm. That could get you in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know? So let's learn to submit our thoughts to Him. Therefore, change our lives. It's like that book I've read many a times by Gary Smalley. Change your, change your heart, change your life. And that's the way it works. And we change our heart by changing the way we think. And I know I need help with that. And I needed it now. And I figure if I needed, y'all probably need it too. I found out most time whatever I need, I felt, felt y'all need too. And sometimes it's just a good thing to realize where we're at in our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much just for believing in us and giving us the ability to change. Thank you for the word of God and help us to renew our minds.